good afternoon. <clears throat> I'm, I'm Krista, I'm a professor here. I'm the director for the Institute for Software Research. And it is my pleasure to uh, introduce you to the, the first speaker of the Distinguished Speaker Series of ISR. Uh, this talk is also quadrupling as a, a seminar of informatics, seminar of computer science, and seminar of uh, the information systems group. So uh, there's pretty much, uh, hopefully, all of the ICS here. Um, and uh, so it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Miriam King. She's uh, a associate professor at our sister UCLA. Um, she's a researcher in software engineering. Uh, Miriam has a, uh, did a PhD in, uh, at uh, the University of Washington with David Notkin uh, a few years back. Then she went uh, to the uh, University of Texas in Austin, where she stayed a few years, and uh, she moved to UCLA uh, like four, four years ago or something like that. So she has been here. Since she moved to UCLA closer to us, she's actually started collaborations uh, more than one here with UC Irvine. I understand she has some collaborations with, uh, with Harry. She, we have also been working on a project together. So there's lots of ties here that uh, tie us together with, uh, with Miriam. Um, and uh, I, um, I, uh, it is, I'm going to shut up and let Miriam talk. <laughs> Go ahead, Miriam. All right, thank you, thank you Krista. It's really my pleasure to be here. I visited UC Irvine in 2011 when I was assistant professor at UT Austin, and now, like you know, really glad to visit here. Um, all right, so today uh, I'll be presenting our work on like debugging for big data systems, especially for. It's not on. It's not on. Ah, all right for uh, big data analytics, uh, in particular Apache Spark. Uh, but before I go into the main part of talk, I want to sort of give you a background about like, you know, what kind of research I do. So I, my research lab, our goal is to improve developer productivity uh, during the evolution of a large software system. So I'm a software engineering tool builder, uh, and my research group, like as a solution, develops many like development tools. These tools, you know, range from like code review, automated refactoring, and program transformation, uh, program comprehension, in particular centered around like understanding code changes or debugging that is also around like code edit. And in terms of approach, uh, I have been using sort of data-driven insight to, to drive my research agenda. So for example, you know, as you know, in these days there's a lot of a repository data, GitHub data out there. And you know, part of my research is to sort of uh, empirically understanding the nature and extent of uh, software changes, like you know, part of the how much redundancies are there, how much like what kind of errors people mistake, uh, what kind of mistakes and errors people make, or like you know, is there really benefit of a refactoring? Um, then using some of this insight, we also developed automated and interactive development tools. Uh, these tools range from a variety of tools that helps you understand code changes better, or help you uh, understand like you know evolve APIs, interactive code review, like uh, clone removal, automated testing. Uh, and many of the people who are out there, you know, uh, who's uh, like sort of mining these uh, big code or uh, GitHub data, we also use uh, these uh, like underlying patterns to proactively, you know, apply patches to different parts of the system, or even find errors by uh, finding some of the inconsistencies or redundancies in this system. But. Uh, Today, my research uh, uh, talk focus is actually the opposite direction. How do we uh, do software engineering research to enable better data science or more effective data science? Uh, you might be wondering, how did I get into this topic? So about four years ago, uh, what, around the time that I got tenure, I was moving from UT Austin to UCLA. I was sort of curious about uh, what are the next big problems in my field? Um, I didn't know the answer, but I used the opportunity to actually visit Microsoft Research. 
uh, at the time, I saw really important shift in the organizations where you know Microsoft was hiring large number of professional data scientists, and they're being really integrated as a development teams, uh, working with the developers and quality engineers. So my research now has a sort of two threats. Uh, one is a, like empirically understanding these professional data scientists in terms of work activities, challenges that they face, uh, how they ensure quality. Then, the, with the, my students at UCLA, I'm also developing tools, software engineering tools, to enable better data science. So in particular, today's talk is about debugging. How do we enable interactive and automated debugging for big data analytics? So I will probably spend like about 30% uh, percent of my time here, and then the rest of like 70% percent of my time on actually talking about interactive debugging. So as I said, you know, we had a really tipping point where there was really large scale uh, data being generated every day. And it wouldn't be surprising to us that actually large number of data is generated by software companies through software instrumentation. They're capturing large data on software usages, what people click, how they use, and also they generate this machine and process data. And because of this increasing demand to experiment with real users <coughs> uh, and also reporting results with the statistical rigor, these software companies are hiring and creating what this career stage profile called the professional data scientist. And just like the software test engineers or software development engineers or product managers, these roles you are familiar with, they're becoming part of these integral uh, software development teams. So we are the first to actually conduct like in-depth interview study to understand who are the data scientists and what are their working styles. And we also uh, conducted the largest scale survey of a professional data scientist. <clears throat> So let's now talk about some of our study method. So in 2014, uh, when I visited Microsoft Research, I actually conducted these in-depth interview studies with the professional data scientists. I have met with uh, 16 data scientists. Uh, they were, you know, ranging from multiple Microsoft organizations, eight different organizations, going from Windows, like Xbox, Office, Skype, Bing, um, and. We identify these uh, participants through sort of a technology meetup or data engineering like meetup list. Then we use a snowball sampling technique to help them identify other professional data scientists they know of and we should talk to. Then uh, we use a qualitative study method to drive our emerging themes from this data. So basically using this Atlas TI Co uh, tool for those of you who are familiar with the car sorting or affinity diagram, we are basically encoding some of the emerging themes with this interview script, and then cluster the participants with our co-authors using this qualitative car sorting technique. Then, as a follow-up, we actually conducted like largest scale survey of professional data scientists. The uh, survey was sent to almost like 2,500 professional data scientists at Microsoft. We gathered data from almost 800 professional data scientists. And these are questions actually really long survey, uh, asking questions <laughs> about their work activities, time spent on different kinds of activities, their skill set, educational background, as well as uh, challenges and best practices that they have. All right, so let's talk about who are data scientists. It wasn't surprising to me that they were not the typical computer science uh, graduate with a four-year degree in computer science. Even though their core training is really on computer science, they actually bring a lot of interdisciplinary background ranging from like physics, empirical like experimental physics, like finance, business, statistics, uh, bioinformatics, or these kind of data-driven field. Uh, of course, many of them have a, like, you know, sort of a machine learning or like big data kind of background. Uh, what was also surprising to me that very high percentage of them, like 41% had a master's degree and 22% had a PhD. Um, and you know, they have a strong passion for data, uh, many machine learning sort of hackers, uh, you know, sort of solid background, like classical statistics. 
But what was also interesting to me is that these kind of higher education background also contributed to their working style. Many of them describe the word, like their work activities, using words like research to describe like what they do. Many of them said that their job is to identify problem, interesting problem to solve, come up with interesting hypotheses, and systematically disprove or prove this hypothesis. Um, and you know, some of them come from like really the background of a designing experiment. As you can see. Uh, time spent on activities, you know, they spend quite a bit of time like preparing data, analyzing data, querying data, and also like operationalizing insight, meaning like building product or integrate their predictive models and solutions as a part of their data, pro uh, part of their product, so software product. Um, but what was actually interesting to me also is that. Uh, just like how you hear the word data scientist, people talk about different things, and sometimes you think it's just a bit buzzword. If you look at data scientists, they're actually very different in terms of their working style, and there are subcategories of a data scientist. Uh, so, for example, when we collected this data, it was clear to us that you know, people are very different in terms of which activities that they actually spend time. So what we did is that we actually use a clustering method to characterize these professional data scientists. Uh, 532 professional data scientists who reported detailed activities on their time spent and cluster these people based on relative time spent for each activity. And this clustering generated like nine different subcategory of data scientists. Uh, what we also did is that we contrasted each subcategory of a data scientist against the rest of the population uh, in terms of a background, skill set, tools that they use, and also challenges and best practices that they have. So uh, our paper that's appearing in TSCE and which is also accepted as an EPC journal for us this year, has a very detailed, like, it's a cluster data. Uh, my goal is not to go through this uh, diagram. Uh, probably your PhD advisor told you, don't put a diagram that people can't read. I'm sorry I did that. <laughs> uh, but my goal is not to go through all these nine different clusters, but just to give you a flavor, let me talk about how, you know, how I can contrast a different group of a data scientists. So example category is a data shaper. These are the people that you think about when you think about sort of machine learning. So they spend significant amount of time preparing data, uh, and they have a very high representation of people with a master's degree and PhD. Uh, in terms of also skill set, they're very well familiar with the algorithms, machine learning, numerical optimization. Uh, but they are usually dealing with very unstructured data. Uh, you know, they are not the people who are collecting data, so they are not instrumenting these services and web to collect those data. And their favorite languages and tools are like a MATLAB, Python, or a TLC, like sort of machine learning library. Let's contrast that against this platform builder. They're really characterized by spending significant amount of time building this data pipeline, or like building a platforms that ingest data, stores data, moving data from one to another. And as you can imagine, they have a very much a correlation in like backend programming. They are very familiar with the big and distributed data. Like so for example, Microsoft, like Scope and Cosmos. Uh, but they are less familiar with the statistics, and they are also doing a lot of instrumentation to collect these data as well. Uh, by the way, I forgot to explain, but this is an arrow up going means that this group, for example, 70% uh, of them are familiar with the back end programming compared to the rest of the group where only 36% of them are familiar with the programming. By the way, I might be going a little fast, so feel free to interrupt me and ask questions. <laughs> All right. So what kind of challenges do they face? Uh, actually, our journal paper lists a number of challenges that are categorized in terms of people, analysis process, as well as the, the quality of the data. But let me talk about maybe two aspects that are sort of motivating the later part of research. So there is no such thing as a clean and well-structured data. 
you know, most of the people who are analyzing this data, even though they are the consumers of the data, they often blame them for sort of a mistakes in made in instrumentation or like data collection processes. So, you know, some of them said it's your job to fix and it's its fault if, if it exists, right? Uh, another aspects that are very challenging for them is that because they're dealing with this very large scale data, it kind of takes their development processes into those like old days where you submit a job, you wait for hours, and then you get a result. So because of this data size, it's very difficult to have an iterative kind of workflow and also sort of a quick analysis and visualization of large data. <coughs> What, what does this mean? It means that we need new systems? Or what, what, do, we, what do we need? <laughs> uh, great question, Harry. Uh, I'm hoping that some of the tools that we <laughs> developed that helps with the, this process. Uh, but Because uh, well, the reason why I'm asking is that, is, is knowing <coughs> that a uh, system like Hadoop yeah. would be very, very expensive and very inefficient in processing iterative jobs. That's just the initial kind of motivation of Spark, right? So that's why Spark was developed. Yeah. So, I mean, it's kind of a natural to expect this kind of complaints, but then what can we do for it? Yeah, so That's absolutely. I think, you know, one is, the first is, like, you know, sort of infrastructure and tool builders, yeah. we need to make these platforms high performing, right, mm -hmm. and interactive, right? Big part of the game is, uh, like, improving the performance or latencies of these computation. Mm -hmm. But uh, what I think is actually going beyond that is not just, uh, this is not only issue of performance, which was sort of main driver for many big data infrastructure and distributed system. Mm -hmm. I think there's another aspect like a usability, debuggability, explainability that we should address. Mm -hmm. So let me put your question on the stack and maybe right. let's try to revisit right. that. Sure. Um, but the other challenge that I found very interesting from sort of a software engineering <coughs> researcher perspective who's been thinking about this issue of a software correctness, I was really astounded by the general lack of a confidence coming from data scientists about the quality of their work. You know, when I ask about how do you ensure correctness of your input or even correctness of your output or the outcome of your result or analysis, many people say we actually don't have a very good method for this. Uh, you know, the math is right, doesn't mean that the answer is right. The other thing that is also interesting to me is that explainability is very important aspects of their job especially if data scientists want to make an impact or if people make, want to make actionable, like decision making based on this insight. Because what they were saying is that even though a lot of this analysis generate aggregated metrics, for people to make decisions and go step further, they actually really need explainability uh, and like understand why the result looks like the way it is. So to go back to this development processes, when I look at this, uh, like almost 800 professional data scientists and some of the challenges that they face, like about four out of nine, this is subcategory of people, more than the majority, almost like 65, 70% of the data scientists, they're really handling the data that goes beyond the size of data that fit into their machine. So this is how their development process goes. They write applications, which they think they're you know, implementing the application logic. Then they download a subset of data from these terabyte scale warehouses and test and debug these, their application locally. When it works, they cross fingers that it will work, submit to the, this cloud to run on the terabyte uh, warehouse data. Then, like after hours of a computation, you get a result. Sometimes you get a result that looks right, but sometimes you also your job crashes or you get a result that looks sort of suspicious or off. Then they will spend like hours going through this post-mortem log generated by these many systems like Google Map, Reduce, Hadoop, like Apache Spark. Then they try to just make sense of like what really failed based on these post-mortem log. And then they repeat this process by trying to fix something you think it will work, repeat this job. So the rest of my talk is a sort of addressing this challenge that we have found, which is like sort of centered around how do we support interactive and automated debugging 
for, uh, to help with the big data analytics. So now let's just shift our gears on sort of the tools for big data analytics. So, so first piece of the work that we did is actually providing interactive debugging or enabling interactive debugging for Apache Spark or these kind of big data system. For those of you who are not familiar with what it is like to write Apache Spark program, this is sort of one-on-one. This is how it looks like when you write MapReduce program. So user writes a program that consists of a data flow operator. And also some of these are relational operators, so like, like join and group by. Uh, but this is actually not a really simple program. Each of these operators takes a user-defined function these are arbitrary like C++ Java program that could be like 1,000 lines or long, right? Then you write this program, submit the job. Job is distributed to workers in the cluster that works and process each partition. And let's now consider like more concrete motivating example. So Alice writes this Spark program that does some election <coughs> record analysis. So record what each data entry looks like voter ID, candidate name, state, and the timestamp where the vote is casted. Uh, this is just a, for illustration purposes, so it's a, like Spark, Scala Spark program with an operator like a filter, map, and reduce by, and it has a very simple sort of user-defined function that filters with these predicate or <coughs> transform data using this map function, but you can imagine that these programs could be arbitrarily long. And Alice tests this program using like some sample of a data set that they downloaded from terabyte scale warehouse data, so like 100 megabytes, chunk it, and test it. She doesn't get any errors. She submits a job. Then now job tells you this post-mortem law, and these systems generate this kind of exception says like task ID on worker knows something failed with this exception. So, but then Alice cannot even see what is the intermediate record that caused this crash. Not alone, because this data has been transformed through multiple series of uh, user-defined functions and data flow operator, it's very difficult to know which input record caused this intermediate record that led to a crash. And when the crash occurs, basically job is killed after trying multiple times. So if you, even if it is very small error, your entire computation is lost and you have to restart. So you might be wondering, well, we've been having programming tools like a GDB for like many, many years. Why can't you build interactive debugger? And that was my initial question when I was starting this collaboration project with the Tyson Condi, who's a sort of big data system researcher in my department. Then we realized that it, building interactive debugging primitive actually requires her to rethink some of these, how interactive debugging primitive works. So for example, you know, the typical thing that you would do in Eclipse Debug or a GDB is that if you set a breakpoint, program stops, gives you the, the <coughs> program snapshot of like local variables and what's in the stack. But if you do that in big data computation, you are necessarily pausing this computation for the, like all this job that you have scheduled, which could reduce the throughput. And because of this data flow program, there could be billions of records flowing through a particular like, uh, point in the data flow program. So what does it mean by watching a variable? Because as a user, you obviously don't have a way of uh, reading like billions of records at once, right? Moving the data to your machine is not possible, and that's why it was running on the cloud in the first place. And if you're remotely launching remote JVM debuggers to individual nodes, obviously it doesn't scale for like, you know, uh, like hundreds of nodes running on the clock. <coughs> so what we did is that we were sort of redesigning or rethinking this debugging primitive. So I'm going to go through each primitive a little bit in detail. Question? Yeah, the example you gave with the exception. Yeah. Why can't the cluster um, kind of keep track of the input that went in before? any of the modifications to our functions. Great. So the question is, like, why don't you keep track of intermediate result that's a crashing, or why don't you keep track of the relationship between input to that result, right? Is that the question? I was thinking more like just the, the data before any kind of processing happens. So as the data, because doesn't the data go in, it gets processed by the functions, and then you get the exception. Yeah. So can, why can't you keep up the initial data? 
oh, the initial data is already kept. My point is that you know, when you process billions of records, suppose that only few records is causing another intermediate record that's crashing, there's no way, easy way of knowing wow. which two record out of billions of records is crashing the program, right? Did, did I answer your question? Other questions? Okay, so I'm going to briefly go over these uh, like interactive debugging primitive that we designed. So first thing that we did is that here's how Spark computation works. So basically, these uh, transformations are sort of composed together, and stage is a granularity where actually data is uh, moving, like because of shuffle stage. And th that time is a uh, like kind of natural point where <coughs> data needs to be materialized because data is actually <coughs> has to move from one node to another node. And suppose that developers set a breakpoint and between particular transformation, we actually do not pause the computation. We remember the transformation lineage of that point. And then when user ask for data, we actually regenerate from the latest materialization point to deliver that result to, to the users. So the computation is going in the background. And we also allow people to actually patch or fix this code at real time. So any point after the breakpoint, if a user actually sees some data and realize that they could fix or apply quick patches, what we do is that we compile that Scala code, dispatch that bytecode to the individual worker node so that we can recompute the, the recompute with this Apache code from the latest materialization point and we kill the back end, the background processing that was going as an initial job. Uh, when user ask for data, which is what we call as a match point, we don't ship the, all the matching data to the user immediately. What we are doing is that we leverage this idea of a stream processing, so user provides a guard, and then we match that guard against the data on demand, and we actually then ship or <coughs> deliver these data to user in a streaming fashion. Also, we allow people to restrict these guards like on demand, again, using the same idea that we recompile this and then send it to those nodes so that we can refetch the data that matched this predicate. So guards, in terms of guards, so you, right now you're supporting... That's a basic Boolean function, Boolean arbitrary Boolean function, yeah that could be like a Scala or a Java yeah. code that could be compiled. Right? I guess it's also useful to support some sort of uh, distribution checks, like machine learning statistical checks, right? Yeah, yeah, Whether yeah. the current data set follows right. the distribution. Right. Data, right, but you can encode those things as a particular predicate too. The only thing is that we just need a Boolean return type so that we know which data to fetch and send to the user, right? Uh, I I think sometimes you need some sort of special probabilistic support, I guess. Yeah, yeah, it could be. But what I'm saying is that that could be encoded within this guard as, okay. as a custom yeah. code, right? Yeah. All right. And what happens right now if, uh, you know, Spark crashes, like due to a particular result that's actually crashing computation. As I said, you get this post-mortem log that says task 31 failed after three times, aborting the job with the exception. What we do is that uh, we allow user to remediate these uh, crash corporate record uh, at real time. So we ask, we deliver this result to the user, we give the option to the user to either crack the crash record, skip the crash corporate, or supply the code fix to repair the crash corporate. And this actually requires us to make a little bit of a modification in Spark scheduling. So what we are essentially doing is that we put those record back into the, inject it back into the pipeline through sort of batch transfer, and then put it into the last executor <coughs> node and restart the computation from that point. So it goes back, all right. Then what we also did is to allow people to go back or identify subset of an input record that's leading to crash. We're supporting this underlying data uh, in native, in memory, native data <coughs> provenance support to allow backward and forward tracing, which I'm going to talk about later part of my talk. All right, so this uh, tool is uh, like, you know, interactive debugger that extends Apache Spark. You can actually see the program set a breakpoint. You can see the bed. <coughs> you can investigate. Now let me give you some like really high level numbers. Our XC 2016 paper has a more detailed result on performance evaluation. But first of all, things that we really wanted to do is uh, like if we add this support, how much like performance overhead does it add? 
And we find that it actually retains the sort of scalar properties of a spark. So you know, it generally follows this scalar property as data size set increase. And also, when we add like sort of maximum instrumentation, meaning like add a breakpoint at each like each transformations as well as a set of watch point and everywhere, uh, you put like at most like two point x overhead. Actually, I didn't talk about the latency alert. This is a, like record level, like a sort of a latency profiling feature, which is the most expensive feature. And if we disable it, you know, the overhead comes down to about like 34%, right? Most of the overhead comes from data prominence support, which I'm gonna talk about later, mm -hmm. which is very important to support this uh, uh, tracing capability. So now let me talk about Taishan, which is data's provenance of support in Spark, which is a sort of work led by my colleague Tyson Condi. So what is a data provenance? Data provenance is a sort of a, you know, well-studied in database literature. The idea is that, for example, if you have a SQL query that selects uh, and like computes average temperature from sensor data by the time, you get a result that looks like an outlier. You want to know which subset of a rows in a database table led to that particular query result. And identifying this is sort of called the data provenance. For those of my colleagues in software engineering or program analysis community, this is a striking similarity to like a sort of a tainting analysis. And what we actually did is that, uh, before I go, uh, there were systems that were supporting data provenance for Hadoop. Uh, these are systems called the RAMP and also NUIT. And these systems have uh, some limitation that doesn't work for really large scale data, like terabytes of data. There are two reasons. One, they are actually storing this data provenance data in an external storage, like a uh, MySQL. So, you know, at some point, this uh, central storage is not able to handle very large data. Two, they actually made this uh, like query of a tracing as a separate interfaces. For, for example, writing a pick script or running a like SQL queries like in a recursive manner. So you cannot really see the intermediate result on the fly as you investigate. So our goal was how do we support this data provenance for like Apache Spark that scales to let's say terabytes of data. And here's how we do. First, we actually wrote this instrumentation agent, we call it as a lineage capture agent, at the granularity of a stage boundaries. So basically what we are doing is that we in instrument the iterator of Apache Spark so that we can tag each input that is going out and then create this output ID, so create input output mapping. And this was done at the late, you know, boundaries of a stage and combiners or like a reducer or stage lineage RDD. What it essentially does is that for aggregator operation, when you generate N2 mapping, you will generate, create a mapping of N2, N2 particular reserve, like a, considering this a cardinality. And if for the operators, like a flat map, where you split and generate multiple record based on single record, we're creating this one to N mapping. And what we did is that we actually stored this lineage table as a part of an in-memory block manager in Apache Spark to make it scale for very large scale data. <clears throat> then how the tracing works. Tracing is actually backward recursive join query that goes backward. So suppose that you want to know where the site pool was created, we will go back and do this backward recursive join query to find this inter input record that's responsible for a uh, particular output that you are interested in. Mm -hmm. um, what we did in terms of optimization is a naive join is actually not very effective. So we created this uh, optimized <coughs> join that associates the lineage tag ID with the partition ID. So as we lift up and do backward join query, we will only lift the partitions that are responsible for particular tag ID. Now putting this together, what we talked about so far still requires you to actually investigate these errors manually. So what we did as a next step is how do we reduce this burden of debugging by creating an automated debugging procedure. Okay, let's consider this motivating example again. Uh, Alice writes a Spark program for each state in the United States, you want to compute the delta or difference between minimum and maximum snowfall reading 
for each day of any year and for any particular year. Data looks like this, like some zip code, the day, and the snowfall readings coming from sensor. Uh, this is seems like a kind of simple program idea, uh, but it actually consists of a multiple data flow operator that flat map, like you know, splits the data into base of base of date and year. You group by the key because you want to do this a computation for each state, each day, or each state and each year pair. And then you are computing delta between minimum and maximum snowfall. So there is also like comp, you know, custom user-defined function that picks min and max and the compute. But it could be arbitrary user-defined function. After you run that computation, you get this result. Anchorage on July 1, uh, you have a snowfall delta of 21,000 millimeters. This is a like, okay, Anchorage snows a lot, but 21 meters of a snowfall difference is still very large. That seems too odd. It's the same kind of data analytics where how can three bedroom house in Kansas City cost like three million dollars, right, for appraisal value. It's so, that kind of like odd result that you cannot explain. This can be actually casted as a kind of debugging problem where if a user can specify some test function that says this is only the valid range of result, what we want to do is that we want to identify minimum subset of input that is able to reproduce the same test failure. Uh, one possible approach is to use the data provenance, which I talked about uh, from our VLDB 2016 paper. Uh, what are the limitations? Because data provenance is actually keeping track of this multiplicity, like cardinality mapping. And when you go through operators or like reduce by key or group by key, you ended up over approximating the result. Why? Because you have this result on Anchorage January 1st, certain output is fine. Out of this set of snowfalls that map to that particular key, only the min and max was used to compute the value, but you have no way of differentiating which one, so you will actually over approximate and pick everything that maps to the same key. For those of us uh, like coming from software engineering community, people say, why don't you use a delta debugging? This is a textbook algorithm that I teach in my undergraduate software engineering class. Uh, delta debugging is a systematic binary search like a procedure that divides input into a particular subset and recompute to identify which subset of a result is leading to a failure. And it will work like this. You divide the input in half, you rerun the program, and keep doing it. If it doesn't fail, you try it a different granularity or complement and <clears throat> rerun, you get the failure, then that's the result that's leading to failure. The problem with the delta debugging is it's a completely black box procedure. So even though the error is happening and it's somehow related to Anchorage or January 1st, there's no way of knowing what is a subset of input or initial subset of input you should start this iterative search from. So our work combines this idea of a data provenance and delta debugging together. What it does is that given a Spark program and a test function, we produce a minimum fault-inducing input record. But what we soon realize is that combining these two things is not enough to meet the scalability challenges of big data analytics. So we implement three systems optimization uh, that are sort of inspired by sort of database the systems community idea. First idea is a test predicate pushdown. So our observation is that during the backward tracing, we actually do not need to observe or inspect all partitions uh, that's leading to a test failure. Basically, if the computation ends with a like, operator like a reduced by key, and that function combined with the test function is associative and failure monotone, then we can use this optimization and push the test predicate further into the earlier stages so that we identify the exact 40 partitions and then do the backward tracing only from that result. The second insight that we have is that when you have a failures and you have a multiple failure outcome, 
it's not likely to be completely independent. In fact, a single faulty input could propagate to multiple data outputs through the operators like a join or a flat band. So what we are doing is that we are, when we are doing backward tracing, from starting from multiple faulty output, we overlap the traces and prioritize this search on the overlapping traces first before trying the other one. Third, uh, for those of you who are kind of observant, may have noticed that delta debugging has its own redundancy in trying the same subset of input multiple times. So, you know, you might be asking, why don't you just do memoization? But memoization on the big data content as it is will be very inefficient. So what we are doing is that, again, we use this systems level of partitions encoding to create a bitmap and check whether we already have tested that subset of a configuration and whether that result lead to true or false or test success or failure and use this as a way of optimizing our binary <coughs> Delta debugging search. All right, so what is the performance like? Uh, we actually improve like delta debugging. The original performance of the delta debugging almost like up to 66 times, or in this case, like 46 times for this program. Uh, by you know adding all these optimization and data provenance together. What was really surprising to us is that we actually, sometimes our debugging time is faster than the original execution time. Uh, here's the reason why. Because we're dealing with a very large scale data and using data provenance, we actually narrow down the initial scope of subset of the data for investigation very fast. Okay, so how do you read this data? This is sort of showing the progress of this debugging. X-axis shows the fault localization time. Y-axis shows the number of uh, fault inducing input records that are in scope in logarithmic like exponential scale time. So delta debugging is at best works like a binary search, right? So it will have almost a linear decrease, which is what you see on the black line. Green is uh, the using data provenance. So if you use uh, this idea of a mapping that's coming from data flow operator, you use a green line to come down really fast. The issue is that data provenance, as I said, over approximate subset of data that's responsible for failure. So you come down to the order of about 20,000 records, but you cannot further narrow down. What we are doing here is that we use this test predicate uh, push down optimization. So we go even down further to isolate the exact partition that's responsible for the failure. Then we do binary or delta debugging search really fast to close in and produce that particular corporate record that's responsible for failure. So this is almost like a finding really the needle in the haystack. And this shows a sort of the fault localizability over data provenance. The red shows data provenance. So data provenance is effective but often stops at the order of about like 100,000 record or 10,000 record or sometimes even like uh, 50 million record. It's a completely infeasible for people to look at this result and figure out what's causing a failure. Test driven data provenance, when these optimizations allow, reduces that to like, you know, the exact partition that's responsible for the failure. And as you can see, big shift comes down to identifying the, the corporate record that's really responsible for failure, which is like one or two record. All right. Uh, by the way, people often ask about what kind of errors you can find using this approach. This is can find both errors that are coming from the like unclean data or ill-formatted record, but also it can find the errors that are caused by the coding errors or programming errors coming from developer. Because we do not really restrict ourselves, like unlike data cleaning problem in database community, we don't restrict ourselves to finding like format inconsistencies or schema inconsistencies in the data. What we're essentially looking for is a like interaction between data and the code that's leading to a failure, which it can be defined and sorted out by developers uh, using a test predicate function. So it's not really limited to errors in the data only. So in summary, you know, we built this easy to use interactive debugger 
by re redefining the bug primitive, we provided this fine-grained visibility into data flow uh, by tracking data provenance. And we have shown that automated debugging is feasible for big data analytics by improving like, you know, the precision by like, orders of a magnitude and also reducing this uh, debugging time up to 66 times compared to uh, delta debugging. Now I want to just talk a little bit about the ongoing research or some of vision that I have. Today I talked about like, you know, who are the professional data scientists, what kind of challenges that they face. Uh, and I talked about this work for debugging for big data analytics. Um, but finding this a subset of a failure inducing input record is not enough. Uh, in order to really explain what is the faulty record, we need a better data summary and explanation. In, a, in some sense, like sort of a, a classifier or test, uh, like a predicate that separates fault-inducing data from success-inducing data. So we, me and my students are working on how to automatically characterize this faulty data by inferring the underlying type, format, and range and patterns. I talked about this issue of uh, ensuring correctness, and I see a like really tremendous opportunity for automated testing for big data analytics. If you look at what people are doing as a developers, they just uh, download the random subset of data, usually the first like 10 megabytes or 100 megabytes, and they build this big data analytics application. But we need a better way of uh, sampling or selecting the subset of uh, data that they could use for their local development. And I think of this as actually a like test selection problem. Uh, also, big data doesn't mean that you have a very high code coverage for your big data analytics. Even though data could be terabytes data, it could be only exercising particular internal paths of the program on user-defined function. So I see this as a really great opportunity where you need to leverage both ideas coming from database community, which defines the specifications of a database uh, data flow operator or relational operator, but also you need a program analysis to analyze the internal path of the program. So currently we're working on sort of the testing technique that combines the symbolic execution of user-defined functions together with the semantics of data flow operator. And lastly, you know, I see an environment where we should be able to support this iterated development. You know, people are not writing a completely perfect program from scratch. They keep modifying the program, rewriting the program. Right now, the, the kind of idea of a big data analytics is running from scratch. What we need is a sort of increment, better way of optimizing incremental computation for these big data analytics. We actually have done some work that optimizing this iterated program refinement in big data analytics in Apache Spark. And lastly, what I see is that these are big data system runtime, maybe because partially because it's sort of emerging research and emer it's being adopted. These systems are providing like vast amount of API without really knowing what people will actually use. So look at Apache Spark, it provides the support for Scala, Java, you know, Python, R, you know, you add like Spark SQL, uh, you know, MLlib. These are very gigantic uh, runtime systems. And my goal is actually to <coughs> customize, optimize this big data runtime based on the actual use of a big data analytics API. And this is sort of collaboration work that you know, we are together envisioning with a professor, Sue, like Harry, uh, at UC Irvine, because we really see this as a both a performance optimization, but also program analysis opportunity. All right, so I want to thank my collaborators, in particular my student, Mohamed Gouza, who was sort of leading this work as a PhD student, and my collaborator, Tyson Condi, and his postdoc, Matteo Interlandi. I also want to thank my collaborators at Microsoft Research, who gave me really good insights about what professional data scientists do, and the opportunity to do these studies at Microsoft. So I want to conclude with this slide. 
in my opinion, you know, computer science or informatics is one of the hottest major to choose right now. And behind this advancement of a computing, what we had is these developer tools that makes you to be productive. Many of these developer tools are coming from software engineering community where we made it people to be very productive in debugging, understanding the program, and also analyzing, optimizing performance of these programs. And what I see is that big data, as well as this intelligent system building, requires and need these awesome software engineering tools that ranges from debugging, intelligent sampling, uh, testing, data cleaning, uh, performance analytics, and also optimizations. Thank you. Time for questions. Thanks. So in one of your later figures, you show the, the additional overhead of your debugging tool yeah. for the case where there was some failure. Yeah. What if there's no failure? OK, so the automated debugging, if there's a no failure, we do not uh, invoke any of these uh, you know, delta debugging or search procedures at all. So the initial overhead that was incurred only comes from turning on data provenance to enable tracing, and that's about 25% overhead compared to the original running time. 25 in terms of time or space? Time. How about the space? Space, it depends on how we actually do data provenance. So I didn't go into the detail. Our VLDB paper talks about the detail. Uh, one is, a, you, there's actually three modes of doing data provenance. One that we talked about in the slides is keeping this lineage table in distributed node as it is. And so you need a join backward tracing to identify which input is causing a failure. Another one actually uses more space. We call it as a propagation mode. It's basically forward execution with the tagging, but you add this tag on the payload of the data during the software stages, and then forwardly like, you know, propagates the data from the beginning of the flow to the end of the flow. The other option is actually putting this lineage table in a centralized server, right? So the propagation mode and then the central server has both like high latency and more network payload uh, overhead. So they have a higher overhead. The distributed mode that we describe basically pays less cost instrumentation, but as you try to trace, you actually need to run the join queries. For doing the uh, provenance, um, is there a huge difference between applying it to MapReduce where there are clear um, intermediate states versus some uh, library of machine learning where it's pretty much a black box? <coughs> All right, so uh, there's actually two problems here. Like, let me tease apart the issues. So uh, to talk about the difference between Hadoop and uh, Apache Spark, Apache Spark is in-memory map reduced processing. So a lot of intermediate transformation results are now materialized to the file system or HDFS, right? Because they are in line together, so it may exist to, like, you know, during the computation, but you don't actually ever materialize, right? So some of the debugging primitive that we talked about could be actually simplified in Hadoop domain because there's a lot more materialized that you can use. But of course, that's why the Spark is slower because it's doing more materialization than necessary. To answer your second question is about how does it work for machine learning application? So machine learning application, if you're building predictive model, uh, we actually believe that the likelihood that provenance, data provenance will over approximate the scope of a result will be very high. Why? You build a predictive model based on all inputs. Therefore, all input is related to the parameters used to train this model. Then you add the training data, I'm sorry, the testing data to create a predictive model. So in some sense, if you deny only systems level provenance, you might actually over approximate to entire subset of uh, input result. So I think that, that really brings up interesting questions about what we need to look at as a researchers. I think what we need is both the systems of support, but also like underlying, like sort of higher level reasoning where you're trying to reason about the influence of the data on the outcome of the result, which actually need to look at maybe building like another machine learning or even 
measuring the influence of a particular input data on the outcome, right? Because what we need, we need a way of filtering the basic tracing-based provenance data uh, for machine learning application. Yeah, so some of this also seems really um, culture specific in terms of like the, uh, the particular industrial culture or the group of people that were working on a particular project. How well does this generalize across context? So if you're looking at pure um, internet mediated groups or transnational groups, um, do these practices, are they generalizable across all groups? You see similar patterns of behavior or is it specific to certain industry? Okay, so I think your question is about the like data scientists, right? Like how their practices or the characterization different from uh, the the depending on the domain or type of uh, um, the industry. So uh, within the sort of scope of my work, we are looking at like you know across multiple organizations and Microsoft. So this is a very like tech company centric. Although Microsoft, in terms of subsidiaries, it's almost like a separate company with a sort of different like culture and organization. But I want to contrast my study findings with respect to like Joe Hellestein as well as Jeff Here's a study on enterprise data analysts. Uh, you know, when they did a study about five years ago looking at enterprise data analysts, right, which was a sort of the motivator behind their like trifecta company. Uh, they were mostly looking at sort of enterprise data analysts, which is more like a business intelligence analyst, right? They didn't have the kind of a struggle that I saw in terms of dealing with the big data, batch processing, writing a custom user-defined function that is very complex and hard to understand, or the challenges of building a data pipeline Right, because most of their tooling is focused on very like BI-centric tools, right? But I think between then and now, even these enterprise analysts, like you know, coming from financial companies, are really adopting like platforms like a Spark or Big Data Systems very fast. So I personally think that maybe depending on domain or the tool set or a skill set, you know, certain industries may be now facing this issue of a big data like you know management yet. Right, but it's very likely that even they will face it at some point as data size is growing tremendously. Yeah. Okay, so, so in the experiment that comparing uh, big sips and uh, deep data volume and the method, yeah. so is there an assumption that there is only one root reason for the for the output error? One root cause error? Yeah. Is there something about that? Like, what is their multiple? Okay, so uh, let me tease apart that into two questions. First, a question about root cause analysis. That's what I was trying to sort of motivate as a research for explanation system. Because what we essentially provide is a few corporate record that's leading to a failure. But if you have a more than one faulty record, what you really need is a like, sort of classifier or separator that space separates this faulty data from the rest of successful data, mm -hmm. right? And that's related to like data cleaning or even removing this data because you don't want to just remove like one data at a time. You need a way of a, removing like group of a data that's leading to a failure. So that's the first question. Second question is, uh, you know, you what was it? I'm sorry. Can you repeat what, what your if question? There, there, is, there are multiple like Delta yeah, that's records. right. So one of the problems with the Delta debugging is that it's a finding a minimal subset of record that's able to reproduce a test failure. So by definition of a program problem, it's not guaranteeing completeness. Meaning, it's not trying to identify all subset of a record that's leading to a failure, right? And because that's how problem is like, if we can narrow down few records as fast as possible, we may help with uh, debugging, right? But to go answer your question, what we need is a sort of generalization from faulty record and then make that as a predicate so that you can either clean or separate the space from the input space. I'm going to cut this short. A meeting is going to be in the social hour. Um, and uh, we're going to thank her, but don't go away because there's some um, secret messages going on here. Thank you, <laughs> Miriam. All right, thank you. Um, our, the next ISR distinguished speaker is going to be Shang Yu Zhang from Purdue University. The title of his talk is Dynamic Program Analyses and Their Security Applications. That's on March 2nd. 
On March 16, we have another distinguished speaker, Nasco Roundtev from The Ohio State University. He will speak on static analysis for Android, GUIs, callbacks, and beyond. Though we actually have another distinguished speaker in May. The next two distinguished speakers are also CS seminar speakers. So for those of you who are in that seminar, it'll be at 2 o'clock again in this room. And for those of you in the seminar, the magic word is data. <laughs> okay, so we'll see you on March 2nd.